Uh, yate, I'm Carrie Billy, the president and CEO of AHEC, and I, I am so honored to um, to facilitate this panel of tribal college presidents. We have a distinguished list of a group of tribal college presidents who are with us today, um, who will talk about leading into the future, the st strategic direction and future of TCU native language programs. So I'm really excited to hear their thoughts on, on that topic. We have um, President Lane Azure, who's the president of Sisseton Wapaton College in Sisseton, South Dakota. President Sean Chandler, who many of you heard earlier, the president of Aani Nakota College in Montana. Uh, president Corey Sangre Billy from Stonechild College, also in Montana. So thank you for being here. And also President Charles Monty Russell from Diné College on the Navajo Nation. So welcome, presidents. Um, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for getting the new link um, and and being here. We'd like to start, um, particularly for the ones who haven't um, spoken earlier, uh, but perhaps with President Sangro Sangri Billy, just taking um, about three minutes because uh, we have some questions and we want to have some discussion and I'm sure the participants will have questions. But if you could just take just a few minutes, um, three minutes or so, and tell us just a little bit about the native language programs at your college. Dance everybody. Mia Okimao Peesuesku, Chief Thunderbird Woman. I'm the president of Stonechild College. I've been at the college for 21 years. Uh, president, I think four years, maybe four and a half years. Um, one of the things that I guess to tell the story is um, when I first got here, working here, you know, we've always had Cree language and we had um, some elders on campus and they're both, uh, they're both uh, unique old ladies. One of them is my grandmother. And so um, they're retired teachers. They worked in both of our local school systems. And so we, you know, we always have these little small grants that do in the evenings. And so one day they came to me and they said, um, oh, I'm just upset. You know, there's not enough people wanting to learn our language. And, and so um, they were just, um, I said, well, I can't control the community, but I can control the campus and the staff. And so um, it was after that, you know, I made, uh, made everybody take Cree language. And so um, I know we didn't we didn't do it this semester, but we try to do it every semester where they're teaching us some of the language. And so we've kind of stepped back from that, but I was making all staff and faculty do that. Faculty still does it right now. They meet on Thursdays. And so um, it was just, you know, they're, they're kind of like the last of their kind. Um, they know the language, they know how to write it, and they, they are teachers. They both have their teaching certificates. They taught in the community for 20 plus years, 30 years, and so, and they still like to work. And so, um, been making them work. <laughs> One of the things that we, um, we, we got a ANA grant a few years back. And one of the things that we put in there was doing a, um, a Cree language associates degree. And also with one of our, um, so we have that, we, we plan that our planning year, we were able to work with um, a lot of the community elders within um, Rocky Boy and we developed the two-year program, um, what it would take, you know, in writing. And so the main teachers are Helen and Ethel Parker. They're actually sister-in-laws. And so I just had talked with them over lunch, you know, what are you guys seeing? How is this working? Um, they're really happy. They're in their second, we're in our second semester. We just were able to, we got um, approved. We went through all the processes, you know, you have to go through faculty, they have to approve it. Then it goes to our board, our board approves it. Then you go through accreditation. And so we got all of that laid out and done. You know, we had a, a strict timeline that we followed. And in the meantime, we were also able to get a certificate because this last round of, um, teacher education funding, they wanted some language on there. So we made a Cree language certificate for our teacher's ed. So that's something that those that are in the bachelor's program, if they wanna take that, they're, they're welcome to take that. And so um, they're in their second semester teaching. So it's Cree language one, Cree writing two, and we actually have labs with each of them. And they're seeing so much progress, but they said initially it was hard to start because they had to teach the language. They had to teach how to write it. 
and and to say it and so there's a lot of aspects that go into that and so um but there, that's kind of where we're at with that. And there's a lot of other moving parts within our campus. One of the things that I'd like to have, like um, Ani Dakota has, they have their um, pre-immersion, they or they have their immersion class. We want to start our immersion class at our daycare center. And so that's one of the goals that we've been working on. And we actually have, um, I don't know if you, uh, Dustin Whitford, he's also on our board. He's got head of this um, group um, here where they, they met in, who did they meet with? They went to Menominee. And so Menominee uh, has this uh, way that they work with their people, but it's just engaging them all in language. Just, you know, that's it. That's all you could speak is the language. And they just started that. And so their placement is going to be at our daycare. And so that's something that I want to work towards, along with bringing the language in. Because, you know, with COVID, we, I don't know about the rest of the tribal colleges, but we lost a lot of fluent Cree speakers during COVID due to COVID. And so that's one of the things that we've been focusing on is how can we bring that language back into our community and to our people. So that's one of the things that we are doing and why we have the associate's degree and the, um, the certificate. But we also had a unique opportunity to work with Leech Lake and they're offering Ojibwe this year, Ojibwe One. And so um, we're learning from that partnership and we're also um, working to have Ojibwe One in the fall. And so it's just, um, you know, a big thank you because I think we met through the some of the, the um, AHEC initiative, we met in one of those groups, I can't remember which one, but that's how we got in touch with Leech Lake. And so anything that we have that's trending that we want to learn, I mean, we've built apps, we built workbooks, you know, we just really want to get our staff in our community educated as far as language goes. And I'm sorry, I might've took longer than three minutes, but that's kind of where we're at with ours. Great, thank you. Um... I really like that. I can't control the community, but I can control the college. And you know, um, mandating that um, people participate in language classes. That's a that's a great um, a great idea. And also the whole breadth of looking. We heard we heard this a lot from some of the other presenters, but talking about um, not just focusing on college, but the spectrum of of learning and living from from babies that old babies in daycare um, through um, associate programs at your at your college. Others are going to bachelors and masters and PhDs. So, um, a, a great forward trajectory. So, thank you. Um, let's see, President Azure from Sisseton and Wapitan, do you want to give us a kind of brief overview of uh, language? At your college? Sure. That was <clears throat> a little bit of the language that I've learned um, over my short period of time at Sisseton Wapiton College. And, um, you know, I started there probably about two and a half years ago. And when I, when I first walked on campus, um, it was amazing that I was able to walk up and down the hallways and have such young um, students, you know, and when I say young, I'm talking 25, 28, 35 years old that were um, talking the language fluently, you know, as far as I'm concerned and um, really um, understanding what each other say and joking with each other and laughing. And um, it really, and I, sh and I say this, um, and I mean it is it it sends chills up and down my spine, just just thinking of that. Um, the language program was well on its way um, to success long before I got there. Um, folks like Aaron Griffin, um, Jeremy Red Eagle, Joey Bird, uh, Josh Waite, um, they had all started um, doing. Um, you know, offering uh, language classes and developing curriculum, assessing growth with their students, including youth, young um, learners, elders, and themselves to to really um, to work with the the language and um, converse in it and, and and immerse themselves in it. 
And um, there, there, there's just an amazing amount of success that's going there um, that has gone on um, at Sisseton Wapiton College. Now, um, it seems like there's a, um, uh, a cycle that, that takes place, you know, just like I say, the two and a half years that I've been there now that they're um, some of these students that have learned um, second, their second language, um, second language learners, um, they move on and they begin teaching it out in the, in the immersion, um, you know, classes, as well as at the high school and the elementary school level. So we lose those, those speakers. And it scares me because there was so much language going on um, when I first got there. And then um, that, that group sort of, um, you know, spread out and start teaching the language which is exactly what's, you know, what needs to happen in my opinion, in order to continue to have this language to grow. Um, and so the, a new, a new set of, or a new group of learners are, are, are beginning. And, and again, um, they're, they're doing such great work right now. There's um, two females and two, two uh, males that are, um, you know, they're in their twenties, early twenties. Um, some of them are even before their twenties and they're, they're speaking, um, you know, uh, to, to, to elders for long periods of time, um, you know, and it's not, I mean, obviously you have to rehearse it, but it's not, it's not rehearsed. They understand what each other's saying. And that just blows my, blows my mind, but, um, they're, they're kind of changing directions. Now we just, we just won a, an NSF ward, um, called the T center where, um, the language is, um, um, it's, it's linguistics that is the, is the, uh, the main focus of it and how um, Sisseton Wapiton College has, has developed this program um, is, the, is the center topic. And so um, they're, they're doing it um, topic-based so um, that you should be able to go into a, um, a course and it isn't language one, two, three, and four, but it's more uh, topic based, like say drum making, um, where the drum is being made from um, all the way from uh, tanning the hide to, um, or, or cleaning the hide and putting it over the, the case and stretching the hide and, and creating the own drum. But all, the whole time is using the language while you're, speak, while you're um, in that class. So it's, it's, it's an early stages right now. Um, so I'm not quite sure what the, you know, how the success has been, but there are a lot of, a lot of students that are interested. And that just doesn't mean the students that attend the college, but coming in from different areas. So um, that's a little bit about the program. Um, you know, like I say, it started long before I got there and, and we'll, we'll continue long, long after I leave, but um, the success lies with the, with the faculty and the uh, and the program managers that are really doing a great job in that area, as well as the students that you know they're they're so devoted um, to learning the language and so much time is is involved. You know, I've had a couple classes myself, and um, it's very humbling. Um, you know, just to speak a few a few words to to you guys, um, and then um, you know to have to do it to to elders or to um, to the instructors as well. So very very good program and I'm very proud of it, but, uh, the, um, you know, I, I deserve none of the credit. It's all, it's all them. So a little bit in a nutshell. Great. Thank, thank you. you. That's very interesting. Um, well, the historical, but also the new direction, which is the topic of this, um, this, this panel, um, but looking forward, it, it'll be exciting to see what happens with your T center grant. Because I think one of the big things with those is that um, you know you become a resource for your region um, and for other tribal colleges. So, so we'll be um, anxious to um, learn more as you continue to grow that program. So thank you, um, President Russell. If you could um, maybe give us a little overview of. Um, the programs at Danette College and uh, the exciting work you all are doing. That would be great. All right, thank you, Carrie. Uh, my name is Monty Russell. I'm the president of Danette College. Monty, Scotland, 
and uh, Seneca and Dennis Shaw. Um, at Diné College, so real quick, um, for all graduates in any program, they require two uh, semesters of language, Navajo language, one and two. Um, we also have a BA degree that has a Navajo language track within the Diné Studies major uh, going forward. We hold a summer immersion camp every year for students and anyone else. Um, and then we're in the process of building a Navajo language immersion uh, campus that's tucked away and it's nothing but uh, traditional hogans and, and no electricity. So um, it's kind of nearby our campus so we're in the process of doing that. Uh, we thought we'd have it done by now, but with COVID and everything, it's, it's taken a little longer. Um, I think one of the other things that we're doing right now that's kind of different is that we're building a, an online Navajo language um, course. And it's not necessarily for Diné College, like for credit. Uh, the idea is, and it really came during the, the pandemic, is that so, you know, the, the Navajo Nation number is about 400,000. Half of those live on the reservation, half of them live outside the reservation. So how do we meet the needs of those that are off the reservation? And one of the ways that we're looking at doing that is this development of an online Navajo class. It's not gonna lead to fluency, but it allows families that might be living in the DC area, Albuquerque, uh, Minneapolis, wherever that is, to be able to have their children have access to Navajo language so they, they can hear it. They can begin to start at least understanding what it sounds like, if you will. So some of those things is what we're, we're looking at right now. I think the other thing that we're in the process of uh, creating, because our, the enrollment for our Navajo language track is relatively low. So what we're doing is we're tying that into, so if, we, if somebody graduated from that, they would graduate with that BA, then they would have to actually get, say, uh, their teacher ed certification. So rather than have them do a two-step process, we're linking that now. So we're gonna have one of the tracks within our, um, our uh, elementary education program is the development of specifically Navajo language uh, teachers that will be certified in, in New Mexico and Arizona. So we're in the process of working that through and then we should start that. We're hoping by next fall, but it may be the, the, the winter. So that's kind of some of the, just a real nutshell of, of what, our, what we offer here, but also uh, kind of like what we're thinking about doing moving forward. Great, thank you. That's that's really interesting and touched on all those points about you know moving into the future, but also um, you know building on what you have. So we, we wanna we wanna learn more, especially about your immersion program, um, in a minute. But I'm going to turn to our last uh, panelist, um, President Sean Chandler from uh, Ani Nakoda College, to um, just give us a. He gave us a really great um, presentation on some of Ani Nakoda College's um, work. But if you want to kind of summarize that for the new, I know we have some new people. Um, people are always coming and going on, you know, on days like today. So if you could give us a kind of overview, <clears throat> Chandler. Right. You Thank you. Well, hey, Nanisa, Nitha Walk, and then I'm Sean, and I'm the uh, president of Ani Nakoda College. And uh, at our college, we have two languages. That's one of the colleges that Yurgita uh, referred to as teaching more than one language. And they're both unrelated languages, uh, not from the same language family. And uh, from the founding of our college up until I would say about the year 2000, we had only offered uh, one language class, maybe two, uh, Ani one or Nakoda one. And uh, and about after 2000, we developed our Indian Studies program. And simultaneously, uh, we developed uh, an immersion school. Um, and we felt that uh, that should be the next stage of our institutions to take over the whole education of our Indian children from, from birth to uh, 
you know, doctorate level eventually. So, um, and I think those things combined had a whole influence, uh, not just on our campus, but on, a, on the whole reservation. Uh, we added more credits that they had to take in their general ed degree or, you know, for their general ed require, requirements to graduate. And then we even added in there that once they, uh, when they get on stage to get their diploma, they even had to introduce themselves in the language because we know we felt, well, they're only required to, most of our students are only required to take uh, three, cre three credits of language. Are they, what are they really doing with it? Uh, are we accomplishing anything? Is it just to jump through a hoop? And even one of our elders that uh, that taught language right when I got here, he retired about a year into me being here. Um, he said, oh, they're just taking it for credit. They're not, they don't mean it. And um, they're just jumping through that hoop. So we wanted to change that and, and change that mindset to our students that it's um, more important than just uh, checking that box. So we at least did this thing. We make them say their, introduce themselves in the language when they get their diploma. And when we first tried to do that, when we floated the idea around, uh, there were, you know, even instructors um, that balked at making their students do this. And um, they said, well, they're not gonna show up for graduation and all that, you know, all these. And do you know how many didn't show up for that, for all these graduations? Uh, about zero, yeah. And uh, they all showed up and they all do it. And we also require, at that same time, we started to require to be role models. We made our staff and faculty uh, do the same. So they had to learn their introductions. And um, most were willing to do that. And uh, they introduced themselves at uh, orientation to the students. And uh, sometimes during the class, each class or the beginning of each class. And so they, they uh, have to role model it as well. And um, so again, you know, we, when all this was happening, the whole campus became, became empowered with Aani and Nakota identity. And we stopped revolving around what the mainstream was doing. Um, our buildings began to feature our tribal orthographies, uh, rooms, uh, our literature that, you know, are in our syllabi and everything. And, uh, you know, even when we named our, you know, when we uh, put the building names and the room names, people were worried, uh, well, what if visitors come on campus and they'll get lost? And, I just said, well, you'll tell them and they'll learn. They'll learn the word. What do you do when you go into any different country and these words aren't written in English and all that? And, um, and one time there was uh, an individual who's, who's Indian too. And uh, they were mad. I could tell they were frustrated and they, they didn't know where this one building was. And I said, well, it's right there. And uh, they kind of yelled at me, you know, not yelled at me, but I could tell they were angry. And they said, you need to put these things in English. And um, I just, I was in a really good mood that day too, but I don't know what I, I wouldn't have said anything or if I was in a bad mood either, but I just smiled and uh, I was about to explain, but uh, the daughter, her daughter was there and she kind of whisked her away. So I didn't get to teach her about why we do all this, but, um, other things, uh, hopefully by this fall, we're gonna have a new associate's degree in Aani or Nakoda language. And uh, with this degree, you know, our graduates could potentially earn their class seven certificate to teach language in the public schools. And um, again, you know, the, one of the difficulties that, you know, because we have two, two languages here, uh, the Nakoda, you know, it, their, their language is in, in danger as well but there's more uh, living resources, uh, people that were born fluent, uh, let's say at a, re a Fort Peck reservation or in Canada, but the Aani, we're in a tougher situation as we uh, 
uh, this place is the only place, the last place for our Ani language and all of our first language speakers have gone, but, but um, we've done some things to help save that with recordings and things like that we talk about later. But, and then one last thing too, we just, we, we too, uh, like President Azure was talking about an NSF grant that focused on language. We're, we got involved with this, uh, with U of M, they're helping us develop uh, a program using Matilda. So it'll measure uh, pitch, uh, the rise and fall of, of a word, because you know if you have the wrong pitch on the wrong syllable, you may be saying a, a totally different word that may be uh, inappropriate. So, but that's it for that one, so thanks. Great, thank you. That's that's fascinating. It's it's really interesting, and I'll ask a question about this later. But about how you're integrating technology, but um, but just remember, make sure that Matilda doesn't scold the students when they <laughs> say a word and and use the wrong pitch, um, as President uh, Little Bear was telling us yesterday. <laughs> Matilda has to be nice about it. <laughs> when corrections are made. But great, thank you all for giving us that overview of, of what's going on and all the exciting things. And I guess just the constantly evolving things, the constant evolution of uh, your language programs on your campus. Um, I think President Chandler said earlier that, um, um, I'm trying to find the way that you phrased it, but. Um, I think just kind of what you said now that the last place, the only place um, on earth where your language, uh, Aani, is taught is, is in your community. And um, that's such a he tremendous responsibility on your college. So um, thank you for being such a, a, a great caretaker and, um, and someone who's always looking forward to um, and moving forward to um, do everything you can to help your community and to strengthen your community. It's, it's, it's really, really wonderful. Um, you know, as we, um, as we kind of reflect, we're all on our, hopefully on the, the end, ending side of the COVID pandemic, but, and we've learned a lot in the past two years about, um, higher education and education in general and working from home and all that during the pandemic. But as we, um, I guess, move into this COVID the Saint Hassan phase for, for us, which is a time to reflect and evaluate on everything that we've experienced and learned, um, we're wondering what opportunities and challenges you all see uh, in, use, in using in particular virtual strategies because you all had to switch to um, online learning. Um, but what, what kind of um, opportunities are there and, and what are the challenges to take advantage of those opportunities in native language instruction in terms of um, virtual lessons or resources? And then also, I guess, kind of related to that, how can tribal colleges work together to take advantage of those opportunities or help overcome the challenges. So, um, oh, well, John, since you're right there in front of me, you wanna go ahead and start? All right. Um, well, you know, we, again, we, as soon as the pandemic hit, we probably had a rough start because it was right in the middle of the semester. But once the summer hit, we were able to concentrate our time on training. And uh, luckily we, we were in the middle of a grant where we had some great consultants that uh, helped with our language program. And they showed us a lot of uh, different ways to de deliver language lessons digitally, um, like Storyboard That and uh, Book Creator. So we put to work our young students our young mentors and um they created different stories for our 
local Head Starts because at the same time we were we were reaching out to our Head Starts teaching language too, and so we we were creating lessons around hunting or the kinship system or different plants or the household items and things like that. And so they, the young ones, they had, uh, you know, they used technology more. So they had a different ideas than I would have had, but I was right, you know, gave them all the support they, that I could give them. And then, you know, we had to learn about the Google classroom and uh, Zoom and everything and even go more in depth with Moodle at our college level. And, uh, but again, the, you, you asked about uh, challenges. Of course, um, you know, the ultimate way to teach is in person, hands-on. And it, it, is, it was difficult because I, I, I tried to teach language to the children through Zoom and uh, they're at home and getting distracted at home by siblings or maybe they're uh, in the same household taking the same class and you could hear each other uh, echo and all that stuff and um that was one and then also the fact that our you know once as we're getting out of that uh, our instructors you know we're still getting requests to keep doing online for all our classes but i think for language it it's one of the most more difficult ones to do, but um, but maybe not. But uh, the challenge I think is having our instructors basically teach two classes, one in person, and then you know this online, and it might be asynchronous too. But they still have to uh, do all the work and grade the papers and grade you know the speech and all that. And uh, so we're going to have to figure that out, hire more adjuncts or uh, and and in the language uh, movement here. Some of those teachers are even, you know, it's hard to get some of we, we we've had a hard time filling our education instructor uh, position. So for language, it's even more slim, slim pickings on on and with the people that have to have the desire to teach. And um, and then I think we could help each other by, you know, I think we're all, you know, I hear, I've heard all the presidents speak of different things they're doing and I'm already taking mental notes. Okay, I got to ask, uh, you know, this one about that thing. You know, we, I think we all have our own little uh, things we like, but I, I like to look at other people's and see what they like and we might incorporate those things. Yes, I agree. There's been so many great um, best practices or promising practices discussed. So hopefully we'll figure out a way to share them with everyone. Um, President uh, Corey S Sangri, Billy, do you want to comment on what you see as opportunities or challenges related to um, virtual learning online? Well, our first, you know, when COVID happened, it was, uh, um, everybody was at home. We actually had lockdowns where we couldn't leave our houses, but we went to telework right away. Um, the hardest thing for us was to get, because um, our teachers are um, our elders on campus. And once we got them on Teams or Microsoft Teams and showed their family, you know, how to use it, we had, um, we met with them every week. And so um, my thing right now is how do we, how can we um, digitize or record the teachings that they're teaching? Because right now there's not that many people that can teach those. And so that's kind of some of the things that we're working on. Um, we've had, we do have two apps out there. One's really hard because they built it themselves. I let them build it. And I just got someone tell me that that's a really hard app. <laughs> I said, I know my grandmas did it. <laughs> and, you know, they, uh, um they really take pride in all that they do and I know I say your library librarian on here they they do a lot of the um my grandma and them they still write everything by hand so that's why they say they retired is when the computer came in and so I just talked some things over with them because they want um to create some more worksheets and so I said well just get them to the library give them to me I'll get them to our print shop um we can have 
one of our designers on campus create it how you want. And so I guess with us, we really want to um, get what they're doing and how do we capture it so that way um, we can still, the students that are learning now from them have a really unique opportunity. I mean, we're hoping they stay on for a few more years, but you know, they're, they're retiring age and you know, I don't know when they're going to be done, but the fact is, you know, we need more people and that's kind of what I'm trying to work with now. And so I, I took the the um, down from Marvin. So thank you for sharing that. And then I took some notes from Sean. I'll be getting some when we meet next week in Billings. I'm going to be like, I need to pick your brain for some of these ideas. Um, and, you know, that's one of the things where I'm at right now. Yeah, we're teaching it now. Everything's going good. We're trying to move forward. But how do I capture that that's going to be best for our community and more or less best that my grandmothers are going to approve of? Because they, um, they're really particular and they're kind of old school as far as sharing a lot of things. You know, where is it going to go? Who's going to see it? And so um, I always have to be mindful to take a step back to kind of listen to where they're coming from when you know they didn't want to do an app but then I talked them into doing one and you know and so to just kind of easing them into that to be recorded and so um, we haven't recorded them yet but um, that's my next steps and I don't know how um, hard to explain that to them I know um, there's got to be a way but I still want them their teachings to continue on long after they're here long after I'm here because that's part of who we are you know as a community and I said you know we really need to do that as tribal colleges it's one of our big responsibilities you know a lot a lot of us have that in our mission you know that we want to teach our language and so that's kind of where I'm at but you know I'm always open to if anybody else has ideas on how to capture those um I'd be willing to listen, but I know that that's what I'm trying to do right now is try to figure out how to digitize what they're doing so that it's here and that we always have it. Great, thank you. Victoria Carlson says, um, Marantz, not exactly sure how to pr pronounce that, but Marantz digital recorders work really well. So thank you all for putting suggestions in the chats and sharing your ideas. We'll, we'll record all that and, um, and share it out after the conference. Um, President Russell, do you wanna give us your take on what um, some opportunities and challenges you think that have um, either accelerated or been revealed during this, um, through the pandemic and the increased focus on online learning? Yeah, I'll be happy to. Um, I think one of the things that uh, we've kind of tried to be, to be thinking about during this process is a couple of things. One is how do you scale, which has always been the challenge of native language, right? You have a pocket of success here, a pocket of success there, but it's never at scale. And so how do you try to create that environment where you can scale something? So going into that, I think is one of the ideas that we're really focused on because technology may provide that opportunity for scale. So you have, you know, there, there are just too few quality, uh, I'll say for, for my tribe, Navajo language instructors. There's just not enough. So how do you try to meet, you know, the demand for all the classes in elementary ed, at the college level, wherever that might be? So that's a question I think we have to really be thinking about is how do we scale this up? Uh, because I think it helps us change it. And I think with technology, what we have seen, I mentioned earlier about this online um, um, language program, is that allows a threshold level, if you will. If we could get um, students, young students, being able to hear and understand a basic level. Then when they come into our language program, we don't have to start at such a basic level. The other thing that is kind of, and this is probably blasphemy um, for me to say this, but one of the things that I think technology and through the COVID era has, has forced us is to look at language as language and not language as culture, because it, you know, usually in our language classes that were face-to-face -face prior, it was about teaching culture and language at the same time. 
And so it was really roughly 50, 50%. Well, through technology, it was harder, but also faculty did not want to teach culture through a Zoom class. So the focus is primarily on the language, which is different. It's a very different way for, at least here on Navajo, to be addressing it because so often we look at language as culture. And so it made us have a, a change in terms of how we look forward. And I think, you know, one of the, the, um, the challenges, and before I came to Dene College, that there was a, a data point that I continually go back to, but I was the director of the Bureau of Indian Education. And we had funding for every um, BIE funded school, roughly about 20 plus million dollars in that range spread out, which is huge, way more than ANA has now or anything like that for a very target audience. And we could not point to one fluent speaker from the hundreds of millions of dollars that had been invested. Why? Because everybody's doing different things. And that's kind of the reason and the impetus for this idea of scale. So now with that opportunity that we're looking at it differently, but at the same time, we have that as an opportunity the problem we've, we're seeing and here at Danette College is a lot of that, we're losing a generation of faculty that were the early people that were teaching them. They're getting older. They're also, because of the pandemic, they're saying, I, I, I don't wanna teach anymore. So you also then have this drop in terms of these faculty members that have been here for a long time at Danette College, they're getting ready to retire. Who's coming in to replace them? That's a big challenge for us moving forward in terms of being able to provide, you know, a continuation of, of um, language instruction. So I think the other thing, technology for us, which was kind of different. So a lot of our faculty, uh, when we went just total shutdown and went online only, our traditional faculty members said, well, I don't want to teach online. So about three fourths of them said, you know, I want to, I'll, I'll do it, but a small number said, I don't wanna teach anything online. It's not appropriate, we don't wanna do that. So we found a way to make that happen. But what we found out with the other faculty is that all of a sudden new opportunities came up. For example, like this, what we have right here. So they were able to focus on instruction, say face-to-face -face or online, but then create, uh, language communities online where students got together and could talk to each other without feeling like somebody is judging them or, you know, saying, nope, you said that wrong. But it was a much more collaborative, much more safe environment. And so I think that's one of the, the positive sides that's come out of the, the pandemic is that these smaller ways for somebody to, to practice the language. Because what if you're in a face-to-face -face environment like our college, you know, people are coming from a hundred miles away. So they take a class, they need to get back on the road and get back home. You know, they may have kids. So now there's an opportunity to say, okay, you have a class. And then later that evening or whatever time, students could get together in the Zoom, a Zoom room and just talk to each other, practice the language, practice the assignment, things like that. So that's a new opportunity that we have that I think we we would not have had prior to the pandemic as we go forward. But I do think one of the things too, that's really important is to really focus on who's gonna teach. And so part of the focus that we're looking at right now, when you start thinking about language as language, you start then thinking about the strategies of language. And so the old way of language a lot of the faculty had was very set in, in the, this other mindset of, 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 you know, just more or less rote memory, say it over again, say it over again, things like that. The new faculty that we've had that have come in in some of the workshops, it's much more animated. It's like doing language through drama, doing language through pantomime. It's all these, it's, it's an active language as opposed to just saying the word and reciting the word and doing things like that. So that's the other shift that we've seen because of the pandemic is kind of a shift in terms of with the younger faculty, how they're then delivering those, um, those, those, uh, those lessons. 
Great, that's really exciting. And I think you basically summed up this whole initiative that we're, um, we're involved with or, or trying to um, lead. It's that because of that need for scale, there's got to be ways that we can come together to um, change the way, figure out what, what works. Um, because I, some pr other presidents said exactly the same thing that you said about the, the funding that you um, were aware of. That after you know kids going from preschool to 12th grade aren't graduating, even though they've been taking native language classes, aren't able to speak when they graduate. They can sing a song, they can sing songs or you know do the alphabet, but they can't speak. So um, what I do is kind of look at my daughter who took uh, a foreign language, French. No one in our family speaks French, <laughs> but she, by the time she graduated from high school, she was conversationally fluent in French. And I, I kept thinking, what is the difference? Um, why does that work? But we're not able to, there's gotta be something that we can figure out um, and figure out what those best practices are that are, are really working and then spread them throughout all of the tribal colleges. So we achieve that kind of scale that you're talking about. So we're really excited about um, just all the stuff that we've learned in over the past two and a half years and then and definitely in the past two days um, about all these um, great ideas and um, figuring out how we can all move forward together. So great, exciting. And I think our last speaker on this topic, President Azure, is kind of saying, um, you know, with their new um, T Center grant from NSF, um, kind of exactly what you said you're learning with the with your new faculty, that experiential kind of learning way of teaching um, native language. It kind of sounds like that's what they're doing. But President Asher, do you want to comment on this? Sure. Thank you. Um, really. Uh... Interesting listening to the other uh, president's talk. Um, you know, one of the one of the things in, in terms of going back to the to the online, um, you know, I mean, we did what everybody else had to do. And it was basically reacting to um, to the pandemic and suddenly having um, instructors that maybe have never taught online, only using um, a learning management system for for probably uh, grading or, or attendance or something like that. And then now asking them to um, to teach a uh, a language, and it was uh, very difficult. And then going into the fall semester, we started using a um, high flex model where Zoom was involved. And me being a part of that, I found out that when you sit uh, behind a camera and watch an instructor teach, um, it's much different than when you're in a classroom, obviously. Um, and the way the dynamics on, on how you set up a classroom, you know, that's one of the things that I've learned as an educator. Um, I was a math instructor first before um, going into administration. Um, that just kind of analyzing, um, you know, how how is this working? And there was a lot of it, for example, learning a language on online or listening to it on Zoom. Um, you know, I'm very hard of hearing. And I rely on looking at somebody's mouth a lot. Now, um, I'm not an expert in, in this area, obviously, but um, it seems like being able to um, read somebody's mouth and facial um, gestures and all that is a very important part of about, um, you know, just understanding the, the context of what it is that that's going on. And I think that has a lot to do with language. Um, but um, just a quick, um, during my, my dissertation, one of the, the topics that came up was enculturation and acculturation and how we learned um, prior to 1492. Um, and I think a lot of this conversation really, really goes back to that is that, um, you know, we were, we were unlearned um, on how to learn to, you know, um, talking about our culture and our language. And so the Western way of learning and knowing now is basically um, what, we, what we've become. And so now trying to go back to learning a language that was basically, um, you know, I don't, stolen from us um, and told, you know, and punished for, for not 
um, for for using the language when you you know I mean that that's your that's your language right you can't use it anymore you got to learn this language um, so how did they learn that language they learned it from being immersed into it or 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 yeah emerged into the um, to the language and so trying to do that today you know when you have um, uh, bills to pay and food food to buy and and so many different things it makes it very difficult but yet at the same aspect i think it's it's really important that you you really do have to engage um a long time in order to in order to learn the language so starting young and in, in the, and i've heard a lot about the immersion or schools we have an immersion school now uh, in, on, in Lake Traverse Reservation. Um, there's a um, program through the, the tribe and then there's a program, the, the education part through the, the college. And so there's like three different entities that are working um, sometimes together and sometimes not. Um, sometimes competing against each other. And, and I heard a little bit about how we've lost some of our good language um, teachers because of of the online well we've lose we lose ours because they go to another program where they can get paid more money you know i mean we're limited we can't you know suddenly pay somebody eighty thousand dollars where of the other instructors are getting 45 or 50 whatever it happens to be um so the competition within is is um is difficult you know because you know, like right now, well, we lost we lost um, many of our instructors, and so now we're down to a director who's trying to teach, and then a new instructor that's coming in that isn't completely fluent in the language, but is learning while while he's teaching, and so it and then the elders too. You know, I mean, the fact that we had um, elders that were affected by the by the um, you know the COVID. I mean, they didn't want to come in. Um, they really get paid squat when they do come in. And then, um, you know, the, the, we lost some of them, many of them because of the, you know, the pandemic or the, the virus. So there's a lot that is going against us. Um, and I think the idea of working together so that, you know, I mean, um, I think we all have very, very similar ideas on what it is that, um, that we need to do in order to revitalize the language. Um, and, and, you know, that's the, that's the, that's the bottom line is just working together so that we kind of all have the same model and, um, we can collaborate like we're doing right now and, and listening to all these great, great ideas that, that you all have. And then, sh you know, sharing that with everybody so that we can, we can use that in the, the, uh, mm -hmm. The whole idea behind it is obviously is to is to revitalize the language and in, in all of the different um, areas that we have and it's an it's a um, incredible task and um, we can't we can't do it by ourselves. No, obviously. So um, I know I didn't address all of the things, but I just really heard so many good things no. um, listening to to you all. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, and you're right about the faculty that has come up over and over throughout the past two days about the um, the need for more faculty, the need for more teachers, the way they're uh, as soon as they're trained, they're um, uh, scooped up by someone, often by some other entity, um, the competition between tribal colleges and mainstream institutions. And then also, um, you know, for the presidents, the faculty, a lot of times they have to develop their own curriculum. So there's another area where maybe we could share best practices, but developing and doing research, that all takes time, yet they're carrying a full, full course load, probably because there aren't enough faculty. But it, it's really, it's almost, you know, we're sometimes maybe sacrificing the future because we're dealing with what we're facing today instead of allowing the time to, um, to really invest in research or development and um, you know, kind of lighten those course loads. So that's another issue that we um, 
one of the many things we're going to hopefully try to address, but it's a huge challenge. Can I have um, one more thing, Carrie, about that? And um, one of the things that I've noticed too is, is that when you get a speaker or a second language to learn, um, speaker that has devoted so much time, years to learn the language, they might, you know, starting out from the time that they're, let's say, 17, 18 years old, and by the time they're 24, 25, they're speaking um, fluent conversation with, with elders. Um, when you start teaching that, the depth of knowledge that they really know about education and being able to deliver and develop curriculum like that is limited. And it's difficult because, they, I mean, they, you know, when you, when, you, when you have to work with Higher Learning Commission, maybe they have a two-year degree in, in, or a certificate now in teaching um, the language. They don't have that bachelor's degree in education in methodologies and um, that theory and all that stuff that goes along with that. And I think that's important too. And then, and then you throw a, um, a grant in their lap and now they have to manage a grant. And it's just like, they're, they're really not equipped. They don't have a lot of stuff in their, in their toolbox yet um, to be able to do that. So you almost need a director or a manager on top of, of that, even if they don't speak the language, but somebody that's able to uh, be part of that toolbox that they have so that um, the, you know, they can continue to do what they do, teach while um, you're making sure that the program stays um, stays intact. That's an excellent point. One of the people, um, one of the professors who was speaking earlier today said, um, you can't run a university or college on projects. You know, they can't just constantly be um, engaged in these kinds of projects because for a variety of reasons, including they may not have um, all the background to even manage it. Um, there have to, there has to be this foundational base and, um, yeah, so you're exactly right. We have a couple of questions in the chat, uh, which are, um, one's really fast. So I'm going to ask both of them at the same time. Um, so one is, uh, I think going to that scale and the interest that president Russell talked about, People are wondering, can they audit a class, a language class from your institution? Or are they all, you know, do you have to be enrolled in academic classes? Um, and then another one was um, from Scott, um, the Conestoga culture, from the Conestoga cultural perspective, Western education style is very foreign. So kind of, of what you were talking about, President Azure, the normal traditional way for us is daily, is daily activities and yearly cycles of things to teach. How do you bridge between the Western education style and the traditional style? The Western, Western way of, of learning, it's just something that has been ingrained in us, in me being um, you know, up in my years that to go back to, um, you know, and, and, and I'm not saying traditional is the wrong way, no, it's, I, I definitely believe it's the right way. It's just that we, um, in terms of enculturation, our, our students have all been raised the Western way. I mean, we wake up in the morning, we have breakfast, we go to school. That isn't the way that it was done um, many, Ehana or many moons ago. It was, it was uh, um, you know, we, we, we plan for the seasons and, and, and the language was spoken and um, we, we did things traditionally the way that the, way that, uh, the creator planned us for it to do it. So now I'm saying that it's difficult to go, to go back to that way. And, you know, topic-based instruction for Sisseton Wapiton College is one way. And I think I've heard that too. And i um, listening to the way that you're, some of the other presidents were talking is, um, is where we're sitting around and whether or not we're gathering food and preserving it and then speaking the language while we're doing, doing it as it pertains to that particular topic um, is, I believe, our way of trying to go back to the old way of learning rather than the, than the Western way. Great, thank you. And I think President Russell was saying something similar, and maybe that's the idea behind their immersion program. So 
I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about, or just respond, I don't wanna influence, uh, influence your President Russell, but could you respond to that? Question. Yeah, no, I think I think that's that's one of the things. So the immersion campus idea is to try to create a a space that is reflective of um, our homes. You know, in terms of for Navajo, it's a hogan. Uh, the different types of hogans, forks to hogan, uh, regular hogan, different things like that. So trying to incorporate the 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 surroundings into the process of instruction no matter what it is this is going to be focusing primarily on language the idea though is taking the same idea that you do at a a, a language camp you know i did one in 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 um mexico city you know that same idea put it here where you're just immersed in in the language i don't learn a dang thing um there hopefully we'll have better luck with with navajo with our students but it is trying to take that process. And I, I do think one of the things that we're really focused on is, is I think as Elaine mentioned, and that is, you know, it's about creating something new going forward. It's about creating the best of this world, the best of that world, and combining something new going forward. Where we are today is not where we were 50 years ago, 150 years ago. So what do we have? We have technology. How do you try to incorporate that? So I think what we're trying to do uh, um, is really focus on how do we take these different ideas, methods, and create something new? I think part of the idea of your certification question is really about, from my perspective, is the exercise of educational sovereignty. If tribes take control of that, and where do you have control? Most of the times it's that Head Start programs in the beginning. It may be BI funded schools. It may be a tribal college. So wherever you can engage at that point, you create the, the rules for what is certified and you are able to do that. So now in the state of New Mexico, the governor just signed you know, into law that native language teachers will receive the same on the same pay scale as, as any teacher. So, you know, so you can start making inroads there, but within the tribal community, I think that's something that wherever you can engage in that exercise of educational sovereignty, it should be exercised. I think, you know, we, we have a lot more knowledge today, you know, from the Western side. And so learn to understand how do we integrate that into what may be our way of thinking. So we require every faculty member, just like everybody here probably does at their tribal college, that uh, what's, what's called the Diné education philosophy. So it's about eight courses that every faculty has to go through in order to teach math, in order to teach chemistry, in order to teach Navajo language. It doesn't matter, it's about what is our way of knowing? What is our way of teaching? And then they're able to see how do they implement um, the content of chemistry using and understanding this philosophy in a way for an outcome. I think the other thing too, when we talk about language, we don't really focus on the outcome. I think we just talk about as a process, but if we were to say, and this is what we're looking at, how do we get to the point where we have proficiency or fluency, whatever it is that you want to identify, and that's the outcome. We don't do that. We don't say this is what, after four years of courses, you know, when I first got to Danette College, I had a couple of students come into my office and they said, I've taken every single course Danette College has to offer in language, and I still can't speak to my grandmother. You know, and we hear that all the time. So rather than lament, what do we need to change? And I think, Carrie, I think that's kind of what you were talking about in terms of that we need to take the best of both worlds. But I think one of the things that we have to recognize is, is we are where we are today. And we need to take that knowledge we have and utilize it to our benefit going forward. And I think technology is that opportunity in some ways, some ways it's not. But where we can pick and choose, we have the authority and we have the ability. Yeah, that's, that's the power of tribal higher education, tribal colleges. So great. Thank you. 
Uh, President um, Chandler or President Sangre Billy, do you have any comments on that? Um, I guess I kind of wanted to kind of talk about, thank you guys, other presidents for your, um, for your responses. Um, one of the things that I know we talked about is how do you do that is prior learning. So we're with the Northwest Commission's um, higher education for our accreditation. So that's one thing that we make everybody hear that you, you have to have the Cree language and you have to have the Chippewa Cree history. So those are some of the things that we put into our general studies. Um, but we do prior learning experience, um, but we haven't really had that many people say, hey, I'm fluent. I, you know, not as much as we would like to have. And so when we do, I think we may have had maybe one or two students that were able to um, bypass the Cree language one, but it was working with our instructor. Um, I don't know very many that have done that lately, um, but we would offer prior learning experience. Um, that's some of the things that we're looking at too, especially with our um, new bachelor's program is our prior learning. We also do class seven, like um, Montana has the class seven certification where we, it's up to the tribal college to say what our curriculum is. So like we're doing something that's totally different than ANC is doing. And so I mean, not in Dakota, Blackfeet, we all have our own, we're all, we're all responsible for teaching our, our own language. And so we do our class seven here. And once they receive that, it's signed by our chair and you know they get their state certification and they do get paid as, um, what uh, uh, and a normal, you know, a teacher would get paid, but that's something that um, the state of Montana has had. And so they really are um, supportive. You know, I don't know if all of the schools within the state are doing, um, doing it justice. One of the things that we also have is um, Indian education for all that every school in the state of Montana is mandated to teach that no matter what grade. Um, so that's one of the things that um, we have that's unique to Montana. Um, and so we do go out and we do reach out to some of the local schools, you know, with our um, Indian Ed for All class. Um, they go out and um, each student takes a different um, tribe within Montana and they'll go and teach it to the students and they, they're able to get an idea of what the other tribes do, what's important to them. So that's one thing that we do with our, our, our elementary education program. And we talked about that. We used to go every year to the um, deaf and blind school, which is 100 miles away, but we haven't because of COVID and we're excited that we get to go back there. And that's where we would do that. Um, Indian Ed for All is with them. And so it's just building these partnerships so that we're sharing what we know. And I think that that's part of keeping it alive too. I'm trying to think of um, some of the things that we, we, we do, but that's one of the things that we do when we do well is our Indian Ed, ed for All class. Um, because of that, um, we really make a point to make that a good class because our teachers are gonna be teaching in the school systems. And so um, that's one thing that I, I'm aware of that we do in Montana. I don't know if um, Sean might know a few other things. Great, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, President Chandler, do you want to comment also? All right. Yeah, I'll be brief because I think uh, all the presidents said everything I wanted to say. I mean, like, um, you know, yeah, we maybe we didn't have much control in the past, but I think we have more control now. And, and I was thinking about that class seven certification with the state. Um, I remember uh, we had, well, here at the college to teach at, um, to teach at the college or uh, the immersion, we, we, you know, we know who is fluent and who can teach and all that. So we didn't need that to, that class seven to, we didn't worry about it for, for that level. And, uh, uh, and I remember I even filled out all the documents and I had the fingerprints and everything is about to send it in. And I go, I don't need to get state certified. They don't have, they don't tell me if I'm certified to teach a language. That was my attitude 20 years ago, but uh, I've softened up since then. And cause I, I because I know we need it, um, but it's defined by us. Like, you know, um, echoing what all, all the presidents have said, it's defined by us and, um, so that we get to choose what, uh, who we want to certify. Thank you. We have a, um, um, 
Michelle Wellman Teppel or Teeple has a, a, a question. The possibility of auditing language classes and um, what we have with our immersion program at BMCC is it's a diploma program. So since it's a diploma program, students can get college credit for it, but they don't have to um, take gen ed courses. It's not a degree granting program. So the students who just want to hear and learn the language can um, do that. And then those who want the college credit because they need it for teaching or language and culture departments that they work for at their tribes, then they can get it. So that's how we um, deal with that. Um, because we, we, like I had said yesterday, at the beginning of our immersion program, there were a lot of elders who, whose parents had been boarding school uh, survivors and didn't teach them the language. So they wanted to reclaim it and, and relearn it. And um, some of them didn't have high school diplomas. So to get them into, to get them admitted into a college program um, was a challenge because they wouldn't have a GED or a high school diploma or a high school transcript that they could send us. So that's why we made it a diploma program. So that was more a comment than a question, I guess. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Great, thank you. And I see Dinah College does not allow courses, but they are developing um, the, the non-academic course in Navajo that um, President uh, uh, Russell mentioned earlier. Let's see. Okay, so this, uh, we have about, mm, 12 or so minutes left. So um, I think I'll, I'll try to um, see who wants, would like to comment on this question, um, which is a, could be lengthy, um, but, but this has come up um, earlier in some of the earlier sessions, but it's about uh, the ownership of intellectual property. And I think uh, President Sangre Billy kind of mentioned this when she said that um, some of the elders don't like teaching online. Um, they want that controlled. Um, and then President Russell mentioned it in, in saying separating the language from culture in a way. But the question is um, to create language materials, recordings, um, recordings, for example, need to be made or information collected from elders and tribal members. How does your college deal with the issue of ownership of intellectual property? And I guess even um, another part of that question is even in, in something we've tried to do, which is course sharing. So um, sharing courses across different colleges and a lot of times even faculty, you know, who've developed their own curriculum don't want to share um, the curriculum with other um, colleges because it's, you know, their, their curriculum. So any, any response, presidents? I'll be quick again. Well, we've utilized recordings of our of our Ani and Nakota elders, and whenever we develop uh, apps, uh, we've developed. We're in currently development of an app, and um, there's a version of it out, but um, it still needs to be uh, adjusted. But the companies that we have uh, worked with so far, um, they they say that we own you know that that's our property and um and we're we're really careful with that and it, and if there's a, a company like i was saying we have more power now and control usually in the old days we you know if anybody offered us something we would jump at it and then we'd find out it was getting exploited or something but um they've always said you know indian country is is big but it's small too and there's always someone that has experience with this company or that company. And I'm always the big skeptical guy on any, everybody. And so there's one person I rely on who's also skeptical or non-trusting too. And I always call him. And, uh, so he gives me the green light or whatever. And, um, but yeah, um, then one of those companies is on, on our 
meeting here, Agoki Learning, and we're we're in a development of an app with them, and they've been really good about that ownership issue. So that's all. Great, thank you. Any anyone else? So it's a complicated. It can get very complicated. I it know. does get very complicated. You know. Um, so we have to really be specific with our elders when we contract them, you know, like we're going to keep this and we're going to continue to teach it. And because we're paying you for your, you know, it, it, it suck, it, excuse my language, it's, it's, sometimes they don't understand that, but that's kind of the process we have to go through sometimes, you know, we're going to continue to use this. And so when you provide this and for the most part, they've been good about it. They just wanted to explain to them because they don't want something shared that um, wasn't meant for that group of people, so to speak, I guess. So we're really, um, we try to be mindful of that and, you know, just to make sure that we aren't, we don't want to create anything. We, we want them to share that, but, you know, again, then, then it's on us to share how, how it was meant to be shared. And so we really, um, we do, you know, we do our best that we can. And, you know, we have our own archives here. We're trying to um, be the place that has all the cultural archives here on campus, you know, as we move forward, because we wanna keep control of our own, I guess, so to speak. Great, thank you. Uh, any Anyone else? We've had, and you're real brief, uh, Carrie, We've had the problem with, you know, faculty that were here from the very beginning, uh, believing that all of the curriculum developed was their own. And um, so I kind of inherited some of that, but we've kind of worked through that, that um, in fact, it's it's not even theirs, it's the Navajo Nations, if you will. And looking at it, it's a larger concept. I think, I think what the founders in the beginning of, uh, at that time, Navajo Community College, I think they try to get around that or address that by having uh, at that time Navajo Community College Press. So they had their own press, so a process. And we're in the process of re-implementing and, and restarting that press to develop because there are no real solid Navajo language textbooks out there. That's mm -hmm. a, and so that's one of the first things that we're looking at. So that's one of the questions that is coming up is how do we do that? To be honest, we don't, we, we deal with, um, uh, Navajo elders, but not for language. We deal with them in terms of our Diness Studies degree that we have as a bachelor's. But for language, we, we focus primarily on the faculty we have. Yeah. Great, thank you. Really, really interesting. Um, two things I just wanted to close with um, commenting or, or asking you about. Um, and one was, I guess, from that faculty perspective about um, faculty needing time to um, develop. And, and as President Russell just said, and we've heard throughout the conference about uh, people developing their own curriculum because there aren't these textbooks and that um, those kind of that text corpora, the standard building blocks that you need. Um, so they're constantly um, kind of reinventing this stuff and um, but they're teaching these huge uh, um, what do you call it course loads so um, I guess how do we I don't know if you want to answer this but uh, or maybe just think about it but how do we um, how do we help our faculty um, and I that maybe that's just too broad. It's just such a general question because of COVID and all the stress everyone's over under. Maybe it's even worse. But but it 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 is a an issue that I think a lot of faculty are grappling with. And and maybe having this community of practice allowing faculty to come together and talk will um, will help a lot probably. But also related to that is do we have um, we need more faculty? So everyone has said that. And it seems like one area that we're finding there is just a tremendous shortage is in uh, native linguists, like um, Navajo linguists. Um, Ojibwe, we heard, heard from great, uh, amazing one yesterday, I think Ojibwe or Anishinaabe uh, linguists, but we know there's a huge shortage. 
why why do you think that is and how can we encourage more people to go into that field and what can tribal colleges do i guess to help um grow this uh, profession that seems so essential to our languages i think i touched a little bit about it uh, on this earlier is, is that some of our early young learners have spent what um somebody in their bachelor's or master's degree um, does in order to learn the language so it's really difficult for them to not only be learning the language but being enrolled in a in a um an academic program so that they they can become a linguist and i think that's one of the, the difficulties is, is in, in um in in language uh revitalization is because you know and then when you're talking about faculty as well trying to teach a language that is probably their second language um that took forever for them to learn and then now we want them to develop the curriculum and that i think is just also adds to a burden where it becomes almost like a burnout for them so it's um that's that's in my opinion that's you know i mean if you're going to go to to school to be a linguist i don't think you're going to go to school to be a linguist and then learn the language at the same time i think there's just way that's just way too much but i you know that, that's just my personal opinion yeah. but i think they're vital i think linguists are vital because they are the ones that can be that that tool in the toolbox for that that um, instructor that that took for you know that spent all their time learning the language to use them to help them with curriculum development and data um, sovereignty and and um, you know just kind of guiding them through that that uh, that process. It's another one of those issues that um, uh, we need to. Um, think more about and think about how we can together um, and with other partners kind of address that issue, I think. And I see that um, Professor Siri Tuttle from Navajo Tech is putting in the chat that they actually have some students who are learning their language and studying linguistics at the same time. And then of course, curriculum development is different, but it's, um, they're all kind of related issues. So um, at least for native languages at tribal colleges. So, um, but we have um, so many experts, so many great resources. I think I just wanna commend all of you uh, for the faculty that you have selected and who've spoken here over the past two days. Um, they've just been amazing. The, the commitment um, but also the knowledge, the depth of their knowledge and creativity is, has just been so inspiring. Um, it, it really is just absolutely amazing um, to hear what all of your institutions are doing and to hear, and to hear from, from all of you. We really appreciate you taking the time because we know this is um, just a labor of love and especially on a Friday afternoon um, to be spending the time with us. We, we really, really appreciate it. I think it's great for the, the faculty and um, other people who are on the, on the webinar today, um, just knowing that you're supporting them and really appreciate everything they do is so important um, because we can hear the commitment and the excitement you know, in your voices, in your presentation. So thank you so much for being with us today. We, we really, really appreciate it. Um, and uh, we just look forward to continuing working with you and for um, amazing things to come in the future. So thank you very much.